Okay, I think we can start. Um, hi everyone, I'm Agnieszka Kotwasińska. I'm the head of Weird Fictions Research Group at the American Studies Center. Uh, let me welcome you to our first meeting in the Monsters Revisited series. Um, uh, we'll have about five meetings in total, maybe six. We'll, we'll see what happens in, kind of when we get closer to June. Uh, today, it is my great pleasure to welcome our newest member, Patricia pichinska uh, who is a graduate of Collegium Misk, History of Art and Cultural Studies. She has master's degree with summa cum laude. Uh, she published in Cultura Popularna, Praktyka Teoretyczna, Polish Journal of Political Science, and in Monographies. Um, she was chosen as finalist in Professor Jerzy Buzek Competition for Scientific debut 2019 and she's currently writing her thesis on the representations of otherness in popular culture beside popular culture uh, she's also interested in intersectional studies biomedical anthropology post-human studies and post-colonial studies and today she's going to present um, a lecture presentation on customary strangers double mirroring of otherness in eastern western vampire narratives um, i think we'll we'll have q a after the presentation so if you have any questions you can note them down and you can put them in the chat on your right uh, on your right hand side or you can just wait and raise your hand at the end um, of the presentation and you can ask the question via mic um, i think it's best if we all mute um, ourselves and and, uh, and turn off our video, our camera so that it's a little bit easier on the on the bandwidth and the connection. Um, and the floor is yours, Patricia. Welcome. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I guess I don't have to introduce myself anymore because it was a plain one and a very flattering one. So thank you for that. I would just share my screen to show you my presentation, my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let me uh, know. Uh, if it's visible. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so here is the title. Uh, it was also presented, so I will proceed with uh, my presentation, with what I want to tell you, actually. Uh, first of all, I would like to notice that uh, vampire, as it is, as we recognize it, of, uh, it was virtually within and in a uh, folkloric culture of Eastern Europe, particularly Slavian culture, Slavic culture. Uh, the first mention of vampire is in Book of Prophecies in the 11th century. It was a codex written in Novogrod, uh, which is now in, in Russia. Uh, at that time, it was in uh, in Duchesse of Novogrod. Uh, what is interesting in here is that the consciousness that actually this figure was born uh, in Slavic culture is quite small, even here, even within uh, Slavic people. Uh, probably if we ask uh, anyone uh, where uh, they think that vampire was born, that uh, when it first erased the tales about vampire, they would point at uh, Romania or Hungary and Transylvania, which was the territory shared between these two countries. And uh, in here, we can see, we, we can already see a very interesting relationship between the Western and Eastern, here I mean Eastern European culture, because uh, the Western, because the fact that they would point at uh, Romani or, uh, or Hungary, which indeed had a very small, uh, quite an insignificant uh, vampire gore, vampire folklore at the, at the time, and if they had, they were mostly imported from the Slavic uh, neighbors. Already shows us uh, this uh, interesting relations that this vampire figure was bor uh, borrowed by the West from Slavian culture. And then it was projected onto Hungary, mainly by Bram Stoker Dracula, who situated his, uh, his vampire Dracula in Transylvania. Uh, and this projection was so powerful uh, that it actually imposed on everyone, even on, on, on us here. Um, the name uh, which you see here, Upir Upiur, those were um, actual and authentic names which existed within vampire Slavic fol folklore. And how much this uh, 
this was erased by the Western vision. It can be shown by the fact that even, even now here in Poland, when I ask students in high school, then they don't actually associate Upiur with vampire at all. They think those are completely different figures. They don't think that actually vampire erased uh, within uh, their own culture. Um, the, um, the names of Upiur and Upiur, uh, they were still uh, quite spread in uh, in Poland, in uh, or in Russia, in Slavic countries, um, even in nineteenth century, uh, here I quoted two names: uh, Alexander Afanasyev is a Russian uh, writer, but also researcher. He was gathering the tales of vampire from uh, from Russian folklore at the nineteenth century, and he wrote down still that still these vampires were called. Upyur and Upyur at that time. And same Adam Mickiewicz, he's an author of Jade. In Jade, we have uh, uh, a famous Polish poem. We have the name of Upyur still. And when he was translating Lord Byron's Gyaur, he used the name Upyr in, in the place when Byron used vampire, he still used the name Upyr. So that is the proof that those were actually same figure. We just forgot about it. Um, there was also, uh, in folklore, uh, in Slavic folklore, there was also a figure who was a little convergence between vampire and werewolf. It was a figure of Vrikolak and Vurdulak. And this figure was, for example, used in Alexia uh, Konstantinovich Tolstoy. Uh, please do not confound him with his most famous uh, uh, compatriot, Lev Tolstoy. It's another one. And he wrote the family of Vurdulak. And here we can see already Another example of very interesting relations uh, between East and West and how they were actually defined by and within vampire narrative, because he used, uh, he claimed that he just wrote down an authentic tale from his country. Uh, and that's why he still uses this Slavic name and not the name which they started to use in the West, the name of Vampir, used still Vurdulak. But he wrote his tale in French, not in Russian, and first published it in Paris. So it was an example that, in fact, they want to see, uh, they wanted to be seen, to be viewed, to be evaluated in Western eyes. The only proper evaluation which we could get as an artist from Central and Eastern Europe at the time was the evaluation from the West. As I told, the motif uh, of vampire uh, was taken from, uh, by Western culture from Eastern European culture. It started in um, 18th century uh, when actually uh, Austrian empire started to conquer uh, the lands on, in the Eastern Europe, the Slavic lands, like Serbia, for example, and others as well. Here they um, actually met with um, vampire tales and also with practice uh, linked with vampire beliefs, like practices that in the village, the, villa the local villagers, they were just uh, illegally exhumating the bodies of her their uh, recently uh, disease, uh, deceased and buried neighbors because they were suspected to return from their grave as vampires. Um, actually, we can, um, we can also see in, at this point uh, the very beginning of a modern culture as it was defined by modern science. Because it was one of the first examples uh, when um, people in the West, they tried to uh, take another stance and examine it, research the matter in a scientific way. So the Empress Mary Therese at the time, who ruled Austria at the time, she sent researchers, officers and administration clerks uh, to go to this uh, lens and examine the subject, whether maybe these vampires really exist or know what is happening in there. Um, this method it, through, through Germany was spread into uh, Western world 
um, scientific award at the time. And actually this vampire subject was a topic of uh, one of the first scientific discussion, modern discussion. It was discussed by Voltaire, Diderot at the time, and they were all um, trying to figure out whatever this vampire, such a monsters can actually exist. So here we have the emergence of, uh, of another stance uh, of this medicalization, biologization, scientificization of, of modern culture and the, actually the birth of modern culture. Uh, but uh, also another point, we had the uh, birth of this strict division into web, modern division, this division all, uh, have always existed, but the, the modern division as identified by um, by the use of uh, of science. Um, this division between what is Western and what is not Western, because the another question was, of course, if vampires can exist, of course they don't exist in West, but maybe they can exist in such a wild countries as the countries of Eastern Europe. So we had the beginning of this mental mapping of Europe, the invention of, uh, of Eastern Europe as a part of, uh, of, of East, uh, which will, as a part of greater East, because uh, uh, with time, everything which was not Western was defined as Eastern. We know it from, from the work of uh, Edward Said, for example. Uh, so actually, um, uh, it was discussed uh, whatever they can exist in such a wild country. So we had that we had the division um, into wild countries and civilized countries, countries who can actually examine it with scientific stance, and countries which can be only examined. And finally, they decided that no vampires cannot exist even in these wild eastern countries. It's not possible. And at the moment it was decided, the vampire figure actually started to be uh, the uh, focus of interest of uh, artists. It stopped to be the focus of interest of, uh, of scientists. It started to be uh, the point of interest of artists, first in uh, German poems, uh, but then also in, uh, in prose, in literature, um, from German one to French one and to uh, to English one, um, in every literary genre, finally in theater, when it was put as a spectacle from uh, Vampire of uh, John William Polidori. And at the same time, when this uh, vampire fiction was created in the West, slowly uh, this vampire, or rather upur and upur folklore was disappearing in its native countries. Those were both the products of uh, modernization and of westernization. Uh, finally, we had a very interesting um, phenomenon when this uh, memory of our folkloric upur and upur was slowly erased. And if anyone from here for Central and Eastern Europe wanted to actually write a vampire fiction, they didn't turn into their own folklore, which was forgotten. Uh, they took and adapted, intercepted, readapted this narrative from the West. It's very uh, easy to notice it uh, on the names. There are no more uses of upir and or upir or wood black. Uh, we have uses of the name of vampir or vampir which means vampire, it's a totally different word. It's, for example, already in Mikhail Buhak of Master and Margarita, he uses the word vampir, not upir or upir, even in original work. And nowadays, uh, we, don't, we, we also don't have this name of upir and vrdulak or upir, it's just not happening. If it happens, then mostly uh, in the Western works. Like here you have the example of Jasper Kent saga uh, about vampires, which he situate, uh, this saga is situated in Russia in uh, 19th century, it's ruling during 19th century. And he is uh, using sometimes the name vampires and sometimes the name Vordulaki, because uh, he wants to give uh, uh, 
slide of authenticity uh, to his saga. And this authenticity is in fact um, a part of exoticizing, uh, orientalizing Russia as an oriental culture. As, and if uh, this name, these uh, native names appear in uh, Russian or Polish narratives, uh, they also are attempts to folklorize uh, this, uh, our own narratives. And they are also inspired by the fact that they were used uh, in the West. So they are a little part of auto-orientalizing our narratives. Uh, returning from the name to the history, uh, when actually the vampire figure was taken from folklore to be uh, to the West, to be made into a vampire fiction from, from folklore to fiction, uh, there were a few changes. First was a change in the creation of the figure itself. And here I put uh, the notes of Paul Barber, vampire from this famous book, Vampires, Burial and Death, uh, into a table. So here you can see and read uh, the difference in the creation of the figure of vampire uh, itself. Of course, and this evolution from folk figure into the fictional figure, of course, this evolution of fictional figure, it's still happening given on our eyes. First, it debuted as a, as a purely evil figure, and now we have Twilight, for example, uh, which wouldn't happen, I guess, in, in folklore. It can happen only in fiction, this kind of change. But what is even more important uh, is the change into the structure of the narrative itself, which gave her totally different signif significance. In folkloric narrative, we have um, a figure of hero and victim, it was one figure, and the vampire. This, and this figure, hero victim, was a figure, was a communal figure. It was a, usually it was, we had just um, a community which was attacked or threatened by vampires. Even if we had some individuals there in these tales, they were always just a uh, methonymous for community itself, even if we have, I don't know, some wise woman was actually giving advice how to fight vampires and how to uh, conquer them, how to subdue them. She was always expressing traditional common knowledge uh, known from, uh, from uh, always, from, from ever and uh, unchangeable. And uh, she, um, she was an expression of a common will, of a common strength. Um, so basically we had this uh, community as a hero and this community was both a victim and a hero. It was defending itself against the empire threat. In fictional narrative on the contrary, how uh, when the, this vampire figure was taken into uh, the West, it was put uh, as a central figure uh, around which was made a fictional narrative, which was totally different, and it was expressing this very structure of Western society or uh, the project of a structure of Western society. So we had a strict division into three parts, hero, victim, and vampire. They were totally separate. We have a vampire as a threat to civilization, a hero who is protecting the civilization, the society, the civilization of West, and it, he was an individual, a totally individualized subject because Western culture was built into the individualization. And he was defending a totally passive society, which was usually symbolized by the figure of passive woman, innocent virgin who need to be protected, of course. Um, what is also interesting and to be very important for, for, my, for my subject, it is very important for, for the subject of my study, of my research, uh, is that um, usually this vampire uh, in um, Western narrative, uh, it was symbolizing the, the every otherness that we can imagine now. Imagine sexual, gender one, medical one. They were entangled together. They, 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 they convergated, to be honest, because we, for example, we had a um, sexual otherness which was feminized 
uh, Russia otherness, which was feminized, like of course, male of other than white race, they uh, had to be feminized. They, they weren't equally male as white males, of course. But for this subject, the most important thing is this race or uh, geocultural uh, cultural, uh, otherness, cause vampire was an Eastern incomer. He was representing a migrant from the East, a threat from the East. So it's, uh, you can already see this uh, paradox or this uh, very interesting uh, relation that actually West borrowed figure which was, uh, which was born in the East uh, to create a narrative which was uh, discriminating for Eastern people. That is the first thing. And it will also pose a great deal of troubles when uh, here in the East, we will like to readapt this narration. And we will like, because uh, there's a globalization and uh, we readapt everything from the West. And it will, th th this will be problematic. Uh, actually, because actually this vampire narrative as it was created in, uh, in the West, uh, it was built on this schema. Of course, there were variations from schema, but this is a general one. And so in the center of it, there was a man. Yeah, I called him solar hero, according to Maria Yanyon, but it, they were also called crew of light, for example. So this association with light, with sun, on the contrary to vampire, was associated with night and moon and darkness, was uh, evident. And he was, uh, he was also, uh, of course, characterized by will of domination, strength, courage, honor. He was, of course, white, heterosexual, we uh, Western, and middle class. And he was represented Western culture. Uh, and his contratype was Jewish, gypsies, every people from the East. And by East, they understood at the time everything which was not West. It means particularly everything which ended on Germany and Austria. There is a quotation in, uh, in Bram Stoker Dracula when Jonathan Harker is traveling to Transylvania and he's telling that uh, I just crossed Vienna, then I will cross Budapest and civilization will end. So we had this, uh, this strict division and everything which was not uh, Western was actually Eastern. It doesn't matter symbolically Eastern because they also defined as East as Orient, Africa, which is, of course, in the South, but whatever. Um, and they were put into a general orientalization um, category, um, sometimes only differentiate into close East, which at that time uh, was understood as, for example, Balkany, even at the time of Churchy. Churchy was defining Balkany as close East. Then Middle East, this category still remains, and Far East, of course. But Generally, everything was East and we had, we had West. So vampire was a symbolical figure for everything which is on the East, which is non-West. And this solar hero, male one, uh, of course, he wouldn't survive in this society. They, they needed women because otherwise um, they wouldn't be able to procreate. But uh, women was a kind of other herself because she was biological, she was defined by, as biological, instinctive, um, a little also wild. Here we can see that if uh, non-Western people were feminized, then female were also orientalized and exotized. Um, and they needed to be subordinated to their men. Otherwise the society, all this biological instinct would, ju would just erupt, society would crumble, fall and break. So they needed to be subdued, uh, to be um, passive and nice. And if they weren't, they should be punished and erased from the society because they were a threat as well. And for their own good, of course, as well, they should be left by their males. Um, but the, um, the, it is, um, if you actually read the original of Bram Stoker, then you will see, because uh, it's a book written uh, by a male who is uh, inventing uh, female voices and all females in his narrative. And they are speaking about brave men and how they are happy that these men are protecting them, how lucky we is a quotation, how lucky we are that we are surrounded by this brave man, we don't have to fear anything. And it repeats constantly. 
So, uh, the, these, these women, they were both attacked and seduced. Here the differences are blurred. Because uh, if women were kind of other themselves, they could be easily seduced by another other coming from, from the East. Uh, and they had to be defended by males. Defended in the literal sense, but even more in this metaphorical sense, because more important than keep a woman alive was to keep her pure. If actually she, they, they didn't manage and she was turned into a vampire, then they had to kill her, simply as that. Um, and here we have uh, complicated intersectional relations of power and domination, uh, domination subordination. Because on the one hand, um, the radical other is the vampire, which represented these people of, of the East. Um, and he's attacking women. Uh, if a woman is a bad one, she lets herself be seduced. And if she's a good one, she's supporting their male. Uh, with everything they do, so she's uh, she's gaining a little of position, uh, but on the cost to oppose clearly to this other, who in fact was offering her a little of emancipation, at least in a sexual sense. Um, but on the other hand, we can tell that the, the figure which is most subdued here is a figure of victim, the figure of woman, because actually she's a stake of conflict only between two males. Uh, one is a good one, one is evil one, defined as good one, one is defined as evil one, uh, but she's just a state of conflict. So, but whatever we find more subduing, uh, the fact is that in this narration, we have one dominating culture, which is a white heterosexual middle class uh, Western male, um, and but two others, one which has to be subdued and passive, and one who has to be. Uh, totally erased and uh, and killed, and which is the radical other. And um, this we can, I hope you already see that this is becoming problematic when we call about readaptation of the Western vampire narrative uh, into Eastern uh, countries. And um, uh, because uh, actually is a it was created as very discriminating toward Eastern people, as a very discriminating narration, narrative. So, um, as always, when we call about adaptation, we call about uh, we can have few paths of adaptation. One is a simple imitation. And why, why on earth would people in uh, Eastern Europe would like to imitate a narrative who is so discriminating toward them? This has a simple question, a uh, simple answer, maybe not that simple, but it has an answer, mm. uh, which we can uh, call, as it was called by Madina Tlostanova, secondary empire or Janus Spaces empire, she was calling them like that. Um, we can call it also a double, double mirror, I will just explain it. Because uh, actually the word, mm, and this is the theory of Irving Sheik, is an archipelago of power and domination. We have core countries, symbolically defined as West or North countries as we want, and we have peripheral countries. Um, but we have also countries in the middle. Of course, uh, this uh, graduation can be more subtle, but let's just simplify it into three kinds of regions, three, kind, uh, three, three kinds of countries. So we have uh, core countries, semi-peripheral countries, and peripheral countries. What? And uh, Poland or Russia, uh, they are a kind of secondary empires, which means that they are between West and East. They are colonized, if not politically or economically, then at least symbolically, in, in a sense that they, they still feel this complex uh, of inferiority toward West. Mm. But on the same time, they are colonizing other countries, which are farther on the East. That's why they can see their, they can see benefits in adapting uh, this quite colonial uh, narrative um, because it, uh, it uh, perform, when they do it, they, they, it performs somehow uh, their uh, inferiority, uh, their uh, subordination, 
uh, but it also permits STEM to be used as a tool to colonizing other. We have here a very paradoxical situation because in fact, if we use this tool uh, of Western supremacy uh, in a sense that what is Western is civilized. We are bringing civilization toward uncivilized countries. In this sense, if we use this tool uh, to colonize others, this can serve our material, symbolical, economical interest. But in the same time, we are performing our subordination because uh, we are performing the fact that what is West is the best, and we are not totally West. Um, so this is this is problematic and quite a fascinating, but it, it explains why we would like to take this narrative anyways. Um, there is also, uh, uh, we have to remember that even within countries like Poland and Russia, uh, there were complicated relations. Uh, for example, Russia was occupying Poland for a long period of time in 19th century economically and politically, but it never uh, really managed to um, dominate it symbolically. Uh, even um, as Emma Thompson, for example, writes that uh, in Russian uh, way of thinking, it was always, even at the time of USRR, it was always that what comes from Poland is better because actually Poland was a kind of local West for, for Russia. So those are complicated uh, relations. And speaking of this imitation, um, the, uh, this imitation were, was, of course, mainly uh, performed by the elite because it was an intellectual elite who was uh, writing uh, and is writing. OK, now it's a little changing, uh, but let's say that who, who is writing uh, pieces of, of literal art with directing movies. Um, and also uh, for them, uh, even if they had to auto-orientalize themselves, and at least they were performing a little of the inferiority, they were feeling worse than uh, their counterparts from the West, um, they could still show that they are better toward their own compatriots, because they were the elites were more westernized than the lower classes so they were also taking uh taking this uh this discriminative narrative because uh, it was always serving in a way their own interest mm. uh okay um but uh those were not the only way to react i mean the imitation and this colonial attitude was not the only way to react uh, it is possible that we totally reverse the meaning, for example, in a way that we create vampires as bad others who are coming from the West and we are these good ones. So we, we reverse it. This is just an example of resistance, not the only one. Um, this post colonial resistance is the, the affirmation of our own uh, identity up until, unfortunately, a flagrant nationalism. And here we can also see a paradox because uh, for uh, people who are farther on the East, um, the practical consequences uh, cannot be really well uh, distinguished because in fact, uh, as well as colonial imitation, colonial resistance of these countries which are in between, uh, which can end up in nationalism, can end up also in discrimination of further others and also internal others like uh, homophobia or misogyny, um, which further complicates the question is the fact that um, actually um, nationalism, it is a Western creation. Uh, so it was, uh, it emerged with French Revolution. So in fact, um, the tool of resistance towards Western domination, the nationalism, is again a kind of Western limitation. And also we have to remember here about this uh, intersecting categories of power and domination. So if this nationalism can be seen as a way of resistance toward global Western domination, uh, it can also uh, be seen as a tool of oppressing internal others. And 
on the other hand, this, uh, these movements like, for example, feminism, they can, not necessarily are, but they can be uh, emancipating for these local uh, groups, uh, local, locally discriminated or locally marginalized groups. But uh, if they imitate West so much, then they are also putting themselves into a kind of colonial uh, dependence with the West. So the, the question is complicated, uh, which makes actually a vampire every, every fictional narrative, but my point of concert is vampire narrative, a very fascinating subject to study. Uh, and finally, we have also to take into account the two attitudes, which Martin Pirkowski defines as turbo patriotism and soft patriotism. Soft patriotism is the attitude uh, which is liberal and leftist, it's an open, tolerant, inclusive, for uh, other people and usually, uh, but it can be also a little servile toward the West. And West is constructed in Central and Eastern European uh, imagination, then liberal and leftist imagination as a good, liberal and tolerant, and we try to imitate it. And then we have a true patriotism, which is nationalistic. And here we have, in fact, two constructs of our imaginary left, uh, West. We have a bad West, this, this liberal, but in this optics, it's defined as degenerated and who tries to impose their own degeneration um, into us here. Uh, they, they changed, they um, betrayed their own European values and now they try to impose it on us here. So they are kind of enemy, but also the victim of their own mistake. But we have also good ways. Because um, they don't ignore the fact that on the West there are also nationalistic movements. And this kind of West is an ally and it's still a model. So we have again an imitation, even resistance, but this is a resistance only toward this bad West. Uh, this could be easily observed, for example, with a great admiration of uh, actually ruling party in Poland toward Donald Trump. This was a good West, of course. And uh, we are part of a good West. In fact, we are even in this optics, we can be even more Western than the actually West, because this West, through this inclusive and overly tolerant movement, they betrayed themselves, they stopped being really West. So now we are the real West who are still cultivating European countries. This is again uh, a kind of curing our the inferiority problem, uh, the inferiority complex, because it's again this dynamics. Western Easter, which cannot go out from our minds. Uh, which, as I told, makes uh, this a study of Eastern European uh, mm, narrative particularly interesting. Here I enumerated only a few of them, just an example. If you have more, then uh, uh, maybe I, I omitted some, so, so you can su suggest me more because uh, I'm just in the middle of my researches. So I will just uh, now resume you, uh, for you a few, uh, few notes, a few remarks without any uh, full conclusions yet, because I am, as I told, in the middle of my research. This is a narrative of Isabella Schultz. It's called, we can tell, if we translate it, it's called uh, In the Middle of the Night or uh, half of night and here it's a total imitation of western narrative particularly of vampire chronicles of Anne Rice so we have here a vampire actually a vampire a female vampire uh, who is suffering from her condition but she has to kill humans anyways to survive and uh, she's not even actually Polish um, She's a kind of cosmopolitan figure. And the fact that the narrative is written by a Polish author and uh, the fact that this, uh, this vampiress is of other nationality than Polish, this is not at all pro problematized. We have a cosmopolitan vision of some, uh, of some vampires who's traveling around the world and suffering her internal conflicts and speaking about her life. So here we have a totally full imitation of 
Vampire Chronicles of Anne Rice. This is, on the contrary, a totally different example. It's a saga, uh, Notash, uh, of Magdalena Kozak. This is a particularly interesting example because uh, the author is female, but uh, the narrative is totally masculinist. It was even advertised that uh, uh, as a very male narrative, you, you won't be disappointed. Don't let yourself be deceived by the fact that it's written by a female. It's a totally male and masculine narrative. And in fact, it, you can tell it is. Uh, it's about um, vampires division who is forming uh, uh, special Polish forces. Mm. And it's also a very Polish centric. So it's a kind of affirming our, our Polish uh, identity. Um, we have an action who is taking place only in this part of, uh, of Europe. And uh, um, there are two conflicting extremes of the vision of the, uh, of the world conflicting parties, polit say political parties or ideological parties. Uh, and it all is happening here in Poland. So the new phase of the world is deciding here. And finally, at the end of the, uh, the day, at the end of the saga, uh, the main hero, male, Polish, white hero, heterosexual, of course, uh, is becoming a guardian of a new status quo of a new order for the whole world. But apart from being very affirming for Polish identity, uh, it's unfortunately quite homophobic and misogynist already. Um, that's what I told that, that here we have cause of uh, somehow. I haven't met, I guess, a narrative which would be emancipating from our point of view uh, yet. Uh, it usually happens that if it's emancipating like here for national identity, then it's not and it's little subduing for uh, for identity of, uh, of for female identity or as you can see from homophobic or little xenophobic. Um, there's, I don't know, maybe I'm the writer, maybe constructing a totally emancipating and inclusive uh, narrative it's not possible but at least we should try here we are trying only to affirm uh, national identity nothing more uh, here we have oleg div of uh, night watcher it's a russian novel but i didn't find in the internet uh, the original russian cover so you, of the book so you here we have a picture in it uh, in polish translation mm. and this is again um, an affirming of russian ad identity uh, also of a class identity, kind of a class emancipation and emancipation of provinces toward the capital. Uh, here it's even Moscow, which showed as a kind of vampire who is sucking blood, who is sucking life force uh, of Russian provinces. Um, and vampires actually, they, they emerge in big cities and they come uh, to villages where still the true Russians live and where they gather to fight the threat to defend all Russia. Um, so here we have affirmation as well, because of course, uh, um, capital is industrialized and westernized. And here we have, a, on, in the village, in the countryside, we have untending Russianness, let's say. And it's again a very male uh, narrative. Uh, actually, every female who is dreaming there uh, to have some ambition and move to the capital uh, to start an active life on her own, an independent life, she ends up as a vampiress, uh, a bad figure, and she had to be to be killed by by males. Mm. Another one is a quite uh, recent movie of Sergei Ginsburg. It was translated into English as vamps, also as ghouls, even though uh, uh, ghouls are a totally different figures, a figure from Arabic folklore, but whatever. And in uh, Russian, it had the name Vurdulaki, so this Russian authentic name. And as we can see, it was quite a, 
quite a traditional narrative, a little Draculian one. We can see here uh, vampire as a threat to this poor female innocent virgin victim and the man who is saving her. Uh, but this narrative is trying to be Russianized, let's call it like that. Um, because one, because uh, it's put into the Russian province, uh, of course, it's supposed to be inspired by this Famille de Vordolac uh, of Tolstoy, but it's a very extended version. And one of the main uh, heroes, uh, the supporting of this, uh, of this uh, main hero, uh, is uh, Orthodox Church Russian uh, priest. And he's even telling now that so Russia is defending now the whole European civilization from the threat now is uh, situated farther on the east within Turkey, for example, because uh, most of these uh, vampire servants, they are defined as Turkish people. Uh, but um, here I put uh, two pictures so that you can compare because uh, uh, we can tell it's uh, it's a narrative with affirming Russian greatness, so kind of affirmative or little resistance to our Western domination narrative, but it's using exactly the same tools which was made in the West, because it's very similar to classical Hammer Studio movies with Dracula. Uh, okay, and here uh, we have one of the most interesting books I think the world, the vampire books, it's, those are amazing books. Uh, they are so rich and so dense that I don't know even where to start because they, they compound a little of social comments, but also philosophical one. Um, so I will just tell you about one aspect of it, uh, especially um, in this Batman Apollo. And there are the, uh, it, they are defined these relations between, uh, between Russia and globally dominating West. Um, because in this world, uh, every every country uh, or every bigger region has his own, um, let's call it master vampire, who is feeding them all, ruling them all. Um, but uh, in fact, um, even all these big master vampire, they are uh, somehow dominated by one um, empire. <laughs> Um, empire vampire head, uh, who is of course an American one. Uh, it's another vampire who was born in Rome, and then he of course surviving and ruling through all empires, world empires. Now it's of course the world empire. Now it's United States of America. Um, he's shown as a very objective figure. Uh, through the fact that he's really feminized and he's shown in this transphobic and homophobic stance. Uh, so here we have one discrimination, but uh, um, on the other hand, we have a very deep uh, analysis of these relations between East and West and the trial of emancipation. Um, of course, Pilevin is criticizing Russia a lot, but at the end of the, the day or at the end of the narrative, uh, he states that still, at least, Russia is honest in uh, in the suffering uh, uh, that is happening here. It's not flaunting a fake happiness, not imposing a fake happiness on people, like it is in the West. Uh, and this fake happiness is imposed only uh, so that people can produce more blood, uh, in fact, so that the vampire can and them. So we have also a comment about global capitalism. So it's a very rich narrative. And to finish, we have also um, what, what, we, what we can call imperial nostalgia here uh, in, in the Central and Eastern European um, narrative, because um, historically taking this, uh, this view, uh, the, fa uh, the, the era of power, of greater power, of uh, uh, of these countries is passed. Uh, so th th there is a strong um, style of nostalgia expressed in these narratives. In Poland, it's uh, nostalgia for First Republic, which was uh, in uh, 16th and uh, 17th centuries. It, uh, it can be met in, for example, Andrzej Pilipiuk, uh, Saga 
the Auschwitz camp. Uh, here we have a Slavic vampire from Byzantium who is coming uh, to Poland, nowadays Poland, and he's meeting um, a woman uh, who is also long living one because she's taking a special potion and she's a noble daughter from uh, 17th century. They are starting to living together uh, in a kind of uh, society who is inspired by this 17th century Poland and we have a, this uh, this uh, vampire who is uh, here is a very positive one she only uh, drinks uh, animal blood and that also without killing an animal and that also even once or five years but we have also an ideal uh, vampire they exist and they are somewhere in the west and vampire hunters from uh, Poland, they have to go to, pers to pursue them, to follow them, uh, to slay them. Uh, I don't know why, maybe on the West they don't have uh, slayers in themselves. It's not, uh, it's not uh, explained uh, by Pilipio, but it's suggested. And another saga about vampires which he wrote is situated in uh, uh, Polish People Republic in the times of, of communism, um, which were of course very tough times, but uh, at least this Polishness was bright there. Uh, so there were times of solidarity and of uh, Polish uh, identity affirmation. So he's still a little nostalgic about it. There was a cover of these two books. And in Russia, this is mainly a nostalgia for USRR. We can see it in this Divov book, but also in a very famous book of Sergei Ukyanin, which I don't analyze because vampires are not main figures in there. They are just uh, background figures of, uh, and of many creatures which are living in this world. But what is interesting here, it's not really what is happening inside narrative, because as I told, vampires are not the main uh, heroes in there, uh, but on the meta narrative um, level. Because uh, both Wukanian called Batman Betov, who was the director of adaptation of Wukanian Wukanian Nightwatch, uh, are Kazakhs. So they are from Kazakhstan, which is in fact a kind of Russian and then USRR colony. And now they are they migrated to the metropole, um, and. Ukyanenko is writing in Russian and Batman Betov made the Russian movies, a movie with actually a, a narrative nostalgic for the time of colony. So you can just imagine how many meanings uh, and how many complicated relationships it evokes. But that is not all. Batman Betov also uh, went to US to direct a vampire movie, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. And there he was seen as a Russian director, simply, not a Kazakhstan director, simply as a Russian director. Uh, so he was actually Kazakh, his uh, tiny, uh, who uh, migrated to his local metropole and then he migrated to the global empire, uh, empire metropole, the globally dominating one. So he had a great success, but somehow on the cost of losing in the middle his Kazakh identity. And what is even more interesting, this Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter narrative is speaking um, the history about, uh, because this, in this narrative, uh, it's about this uh, war um, against slavery, which Abraham Lincoln started, and on this uh, and the South is defined by the fact that they had slaves. They were supported by vampires because vampires they were feeding on slaves. And then that now Abraham Lincoln he's fighting this uh, South and the vampires at the same time. So we have here actually a movie about internal colonization in the West, made by someone who was externally colonized by the West. Of, by the West as a Russian and internally in the Russian as the other from the colony. So here we have a very a graduation of these relations, which makes them, which makes even this one case uh, a possible subject for a whole study. And at the end, I just giving you these posters of all these movies. And here we have the posters of this book, they were translated into English. Uh, as I told, I'm in the middle of my research. 
So I don't give you any final conclusion, but I'm open to your questions, even to your suggestions. Uh, maybe you know some other vampire narratives, which I should uh, also analyze. So now it's time for, for you to speak, for you to ask me questions, for you to suggest me things. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Mm. Thank you for a great lecture. As I said in the beginning, um, if you have any questions, you can post them on the right in the chat box, or you can uh, raise your hand and, um, and and ask the question via mic. Um, and honestly, since I'm on the mic already, I would like to ask the first question, if I may. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I really loved it. I, I made quite a lot of notes. Um, but I really wanted to to learn um, more about something you mentioned in the very beginning when you were talking about this projection and this kind of um, let's say double othering of the of, of the East. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned something called biologization or scientification in this in this context or medicalization. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about this, like how this medicalization of vampires or upior upior kind of work in in Western narratives? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that is a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, first thing, uh, there was no uh, medicalization of upir or upir because it was only a folkloric figure. And when this uh, medicalization came, it came from the West with vampire narrative, with vampire figure, not upir. Uh, upir. So uh, that, that there couldn't be. But as for the um, as for the Western medicalization. Mm -hmm. There's a whole book uh, of uh, Nick Groom who is uh, putting these links. Um, a vampire uh, emerged, this vampire narrative emerged at the same time uh, with uh, the emergence of, of modern medicine. And in fact, it was uh, from the very beginning defined by, by, the, uh, by the medicine, even inside the narratives. So mostly the solar heroes, uh, the screw of life, in almost all the narratives, and it increases with time. Uh, they are, uh, at least one of them is a doctor. And it's not without any reason. For example, in Dracula's uh, Bram Stoker, we have this, um, this Dr. Stewart, who is a uh, doctor for uh, lunatic hospital and it's not that i'm using this word lunatic now because it's a very depreciating one but he calls them like that and he's also the one who is uh subduing the vampire in fact if not doctor only uh, if there was not explicit a doctor figure these uh, vampires they were more and more defined even though it was a fictional figure inside the narrative they were uh, defined with terms of biology and medicine um they were frequently animalized like uh, they were compared to animals um or they were compared to people who were uh, who were kind of unhealthy and this is again very important because this brings us back to this um, Ag even to Agamben work, uh, who was telling that actually our culture mm, is um, our culture's Western society, if I can tell our, because I, <laughs> I was all the time I was telling that Polish is in the between, but let's say, uh, but we are taking it slowly, so let's stay. So I will sometimes tell our just to, to shorten. Western culture uh, was built on the um, on the uh, rule of exception. Like we had this uh, solar hero who was a little accepted from the locals. He was a guarder. He was a guardian. He could. Uh, he, he was guarding this law. And we had the, the one who was exposed, the other, and the society who needed protection was within the domain of the law itself. And this was defined by the medicine as well. Uh, for example, those are uh, doctors who are deciding who is dead and who is not. We had this uh, brain death definition, which is defined. Uh, I'm not uh, questioning now whatever it's wrong or right, and it's not the, uh, the time and place here. But we have, uh, but those are doctor, this is modern medicine, who is deciding what is uh, that and what is not. 
And this is very important for vampire narrative. It's expressing vampire narrative because this is, uh, again, doctor or someone who is having a medical insight who is deciding that a vampire is, in fact, a dead corpse only. Or this is more biological stance. He's deciding that vampire is not from human species. And if he's not from human species, he becomes the other, he becomes the body, he becomes the thing. And, the, and on the thing, we can perform. <laughs> Here I will rhyme, sorry for that. On the thing, we can perform everything. So it's actually becoming the thing on which we can perform everything. We can kill it without any consequences, but we should kill it because it's a thing which out of sudden uh, rises, speaks, and is even attacking us. So we have to kill this thing. And all of this is this very category, this very differentiation between what is other and what is not is made through biological and medical means. And it becomes important also in relations between West and East as uh, those were also medicine who was defining, um, it's, it's a very unglorious part. Of course, we have eugenic, yes, these races who are trying, trying to be defined by, uh, by medicine, uh, but not necessarily that. There are some things which are still remaining. We do not, uh, we abolish this so-called medical and biological race hierarchy, but for example, even uh, pathogen theory invented by Robert Koch served to uh, put this border within West and East. And it was supposed that on the East, there is more spread of bacteria uh, than in the West. So um, it was theoretically, it was freeing these people from uh, it was free because bacteria and pathogens they can spread everywhere so we should not blame people on the west but in practice it was put totally on the uh, on the east uh, that those people th those are the people who should be separated because they are actually uh, a spread of bacteria which can go into us uh, there is a very interesting book of uh, um, Lenny Valerio about uh, Pol Germany and Polish colonization. She, and he's, uh, he's writing a lot about the fact how Germans, they were they're putting these borders and telling, for example, that cholera uh, is a domain of Polish provinces. And they were these cordon sanitars to, to, to put between both of them. So it was also defined in, in strictly medical terms and medicine helped to define the otherness in a sense of race, in a sense of gen, in a sexual sense, of course, because uh, uh, this whole theory, what is deviant in sexual behavior and what is not. And first of all, in the, uh, maybe first of all, not the last one, in the terms of species, that uh, there is uh, this human species who is a person and there's animal species who is not a person. So of course, uh, we can treat them otherwise. It was all defined by, by, by biology and medicalization. And another type, just to finish asking your question, it was, of course, Western culture, who is uh, the culture of medicine, and Eastern culture, who is less developed. We can study them, they can be our uh, object of study, but not a subject of uh, which, in, in fact, uh, can study. Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, Thank you. Okay, Thank you I have one question, please. Uh, we have a question in the chat box, so maybe we can we can start okay. with this one and then uh, Claudia's question. Uh, so Piotr Bashtik, um says, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting and insightful. I would like to ask about your opinion on vampire narrative in the movie Twilight. Are there any similarities to Western vampire tropes? Uh, yes, Twilight. Twilight is uh, Twilight got a, a lot of studies um, called uh, because it seems to be a very new narrative, a very emancipative one, because we have here a reversal of roles. Like we have a vampire who is a main hero. And these hunters or those who are against him, they are shown as, if not bad, then at least less right, little morally wrong, because of course, Edward is good, why to hunt him? Um, 
So uh, on the first side, uh, we have the Tor Rivelsar uh, evaluation of this uh, vampire narrative, uh, mark of inclusivity, and whatever uh, whatever else you want, the tolerance, greater, and so on. And in fact, it was interpreted that way by few of the researchers. Um, from both right and left, once they were saying, oh, it's great, it's very inclusive, finally, and once they were telling, oh, our civilization is ending, because uh, now we have a vampire as a hero, and it shows that we, uh, that everything is relativized in our culture, and so on. But uh, then a uh, few researchers noted that actually, um, this is just a superficial reversal, because in fact, we still have a uh, male, heterosexual, white, Western guy. Moreover, he's from, and we have to remember about it, uh, that with, even within the United States of America, not, I guess, who am I speaking to? You are from American studies, but it's not, uh, I would just remind to, to those who are not students of uh, American Center and University, that it's not that every part of America is equal. We have still the, uh, the consequences of the war, uh, South versus North, and he's a Norfolk one, Edward. Totally not for one, we have to remember about the stereotypes about this more sensual, sulfur gentleman and uh, this more composed, uh, respectful and better northern one. And he's totally northern, of course. And it seems that just by accident is happening to be a vampire just to, to make him even more attractive. And we have a woman who seems to choose the mostly um, the mostly emancipative, the mostly transgressive relations as she can, but in fact she chooses what she all have always chose in this uh, traditional uh, vampire narrative, because she chooses this white heterosexual Western male over someone who is little other, over a lower class uh, Native American. Uh, so she's not very transgressive, and if you talk about their relationship, she's becoming totally uh, subdued, totally subaltern. Uh, she had to even beg, uh, in every manner, even in like usually we can we can argue that still vampire attacking woman was a an image of a rape, but, but there is still an, an image of a female having some sexual pleasure. So even if it's not emancipating in a social way, it, it's still at, at least literally sexual emancipating. Here we don't even have that. She has to beg for sex even after marriage. Uh, so called, uh, he's of course doing this for her own good. So, but but just look at this situation. We have a female who is uh, so we would call it uh, I guess a little vulgarly brainwashed that uh, she in fact after every intercourse she's hurt she's beaten uh, and still she has to beg for more because he doesn't want to and he lets himself be begged uh, so we can tell that in fact when um, in the situation when here this woman she had two options maybe one uh, maybe both they were equally wrong but still she had two options uh, she could choose a total subordination or at least sexual emancipation if she went for a vampire. Of course, for this option, she was punished and killed, but at least she had it. And here, when solar hero and vampire are one, she does not even have such an option. So as for emancipation, emancipative uh, dimension of this narrative, and if it's very new, uh, I guess it's not, and it's still expressing same meaning as a traditional one, and even very similar structure, just on the surface, it's it's a little different. Uh, I don't know if it uh, answers your question. Uh, I tried to make a short uh, comparison between uh, this traditional classical structure and this new one. Um, th thank you. Uh, we have a question from Claudia. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. And I was actually thinking about medicalization in the context of this transition from the folklore uh, to fictional vamp like uh, vampire figure. Uh, I, I was thinking about Peter Watts' blindside. Uh, actually, I don't know, like probably you're aware of uh, 
what he has done with the figure of vampire because he basically he provided us with this like a uh, plausible <laughs> narrative like with the vampire figure is actually uh another like humanoid species coming like dated ba back to the pleistocene uh, and kind of like he he gives this whole like uh, like pseudo scientific background to to it and i was just wondering that's not even a question as much as i would like to hear your thoughts on on what what he has done uh with with the figure of vampire like how does it like position uh, itself in this idea of othering because well clearly like this is like what what you what you've mentioned like what uh describes a vampire as this another species so it's very easy to actually uh, like impose certain traits on 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 this kind of vampire figure and Obviously, uh, in the book, I don't, I don't really want to spoil uh, the, it to anyone, but, uh, well, the vampire is basically kind of, like, more intelligent than, uh, than an average, like, not even an average uh, human, but most humans, every, every single human, in fact, and he is uh, a captain of a mission, and, and he's basically, like, going out there on the, on the outskirts of the solar system without the perspective of coming back as much so i was just thinking like those are some loose thoughts but uh, i thought that this is kind of interesting uh that science fiction kind of adapts it and and um, puts it even like one step forward so yeah that's it thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much yes it's very interesting this um is what you told because actually yes uh, let's do it. I will put it on, because uh, otherwise it would be difficult for me not to spoil. I put it on a just general, um, a general platform. Like, yes, we can, uh, this uh, defining vampire as another kind of species can have two dimensions. One, it is that, uh, and it's a quite traditional stance, a very anthropocentric one, if it's different species, then it's especially and especially if it attacks human and it's a different species, then we can and we have to get rid of it. Uh, it's our duty. We have to protect ourselves. And this first thing. But as you told, uh, it can also serve to uh, put at least a little of ambivalency on that, because if it's other species, it can be also a higher species than us and uh, or simply different so we cannot blame them especially if we are this more humans are carnivores so if we eat other species then how can we blame them so we have a number valency or we can even uh, put it as um, and here we, we will have advocacy we can tell for uh, advocacy for some um, emancipation of different spaces. It was called also the admission of personhood. I, uh, this is a very uh, likable term. I like this term a lot, personhood. I've never meant it. I don't know how to translate it into Polish in my work, in my, in my, uh, in my research. I have a problem because personhood is a perfect term. Uh, so we have a, a little of admission of this personhood for another species. Because if we don't want to be eaten by a higher species, maybe we should also not eat those who are lower from us. And we have uh, plenty of narratives in which we have this uh, vampire uh, vegetarians, let's say, who try to avoid drinking human uh, blood. They have artificial blood, blood or something else. They have, uh, they are trying to hunt humans only if, if they are, um, if they are uh, willing donors, or again, they are eating this animal blood only. Um, but um, again, we can tell it's uh, this advocacy for um, another species. On the example that vampires are another species, and we should not all. And anyways, we don't order them that much. Uh, or they are another species, they don't eat us, so we should not eat. It's also limited. It's still defined by anthropocentric view uh, because uh, the motivation to act differently against other species is not 
really that they are equal, we should not, is still because someone else will eat us then. Or, and also we have these vampires who are so-called vegetarians, which means that they don't eat humans, but they eat animals. So we still are performing this hierarchy. We are not really admitting that every species is equal. And moreover, in most of these narratives, uh, there is um, a kind of ambivalence still. I mean here that if vampires are different species, even a higher one, uh, it's never defined as totally higher. There is always ambivalency. From some part, it's higher, but for some others, it's still lower. And we have still, it's still a domain of negotiation for the narrative itself. It's usually expressed by uh, two points of view within narrative. One is telling they are worse, one is telling they are better. And we somehow try to negotiate. Uh, but at the end of most of the narratives, they still uh, are little worse, or at least if not, then okay, they can even be better. They can even be our heroes, like go to the, go to the solar system, like you told, but they need to be exposed. They cannot live within society anyways. So we have no place for them. And they have to, to go to the border to return to the nature, to return to the cosmic space. So, um, so I don't think we have a total, um, total equality and total vision of emancipation, or at least very, very rarely. Still, which is uh, which is what uh, what we uh, what we should have, but uh, but we don't, and it's it expresses, I guess, the fact that we still don't have a perfect equality in our society. We are still other. Well, thank you so much. Actually, yes, in one blind side, uh, like it, uh, vampires. Oh, I'm sorry, because I, I, I think I got frozen for a second. Uh, it was really interesting. Thank you for your answer, because like in blind side, in fact, uh, vampires are. Uh, well, on the on the one hand, they are like superior to us, but then on the other hand, like people don't want to be around them. They are terrifying. They are like really um, kind of disgusting, I, I would say. But this is very very interesting. Uh, what you mentioned, uh, like trying to situate them in a food chain. I, I I really like that. Thank you so much for 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 the answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question again and for your answer, Patricia. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, here, uh, I have uh, some other comments on chat. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, maybe I'll read it out loud for the okay. for the lecture because it won't be uh, for, for the recording. Uh, so from Hrishi, I really liked your presentation, The Health I Watched. I found very interesting the way Polish writers reclaim the vampire. And I want to study this fact now. Vampires are one of the most interesting folklore creatures who show the otherness in so many and different levels. And this is why they remain still in our lives and they change as we change. I studied, uh, studied Greek folklore from my grad project in architecture, and I really liked how you mentioned the state of exception, which applies in so many of the folk tales. I would love to have it, if you're open to it, the whole presentation as a PDF, or maybe even as a video. So I, let me just answer, because we actually are, we are, we are recording this, so we'll have it uploaded in a um, couple of weeks' time, probably after, after the Easter break. So look on, um, subscribe to our uh, Facebook profile, Weird Fictions Research Group, or I will uh, post in a moment the um, the address for our official website of our American Studies Center. Mm -hmm. And maybe I will I will comment still uh, about this Greek folklore because um, uh, Greece is not. Um, as I told, uh, the vampire figure emerged in Slavic culture, so Greece is obviously not a Slavic culture, but it's very close to them. So Greece, anyways, had a lot of uh, had a lot of because uh, people um, borders were not never very close, so people and ideas were still migrating a little. But Greece um, took most of this uh, Vurdolak and Vrikolak um, uh, figures. And with Greece, it's a very interesting thing, uh, in a sense, how West saw it. As I told, it was not a, 
a nest, uh, a place of emergence of vampire uh, folklore, but it had a little imported. And then uh, when West came and found vampire figure and then borrowed it to his fiction, um, they had a little problem with Greece. Because on the other hand, Greece was situated in the east, near Balkany. Uh, it was at the time occupied by Turkey, so even further east, you know, Middle East, typical Orient. But on the other hand, it was a source of European civilization. It was still regarded as that. So actually, uh, it's also a very interesting subject for how to West tried to cope with it. For example, Gyaur action is taking place in Greece, occupied by Turkey at the time, is mentioning a vampire figure who just does in the backward when he tells that uh, a, a kind of curse that you will become a vampire and you will drink other bloods, so bloods of your closest ones. But, and he situates it in Greece, but he is speaking about it only with occasion when speaking about Turkish occupants, Turkish people. Because uh, uh, Gyaur didn't want really to uh, other Greece that much because otherwise, because Greece was a source of, was a source of, of culture. So we have this uh, very uh, interesting um, Paul, uh, platform, domain, area, in geographical and symbolical sense of negotiation uh, of what was uh, showed um, of, and the use of vampire to show and mark what is Eastern and what is Western, even in the same territory. Very interesting subject as well. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions perhaps? Um, we have one more question. So, Patricia, do you have time? Can we stay a little bit longer? Because we have we have two questions from Pierre. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I will I will read them. Okay. Uh, that I said that school uh, high school students associate Upyur with something else than vampires. What do they associate Upyur with? Uh, they simply uh, think it's something some other revenant. Like we have ghost, then we have Upyur, uh, then we have uh, vampire. Um, then we have ghouls. Did, did they just think that Upyur is a kind of something totally else? Um, not only students. I had uh, I had occasion to make a lecture about uh, about vampire in uh, in one of the high school. This uh, popular one lecture and uh, the teacher previously when when they were talking about the uh, about the jad she told them the specifically that uh, uh, here is upur he's uh, coming from, from back from the grave um, but don't mix it with a vampire vampires are uh, in some twilight series uh, this is a serious literature which was uh, then a very awkward situation for me when i had to Quite a contradict what teacher had previously say. Um, I, I just I tried not to do it with my own words. I just quoted Maria Yanion, which is a famous researcher, and she wrote about it as well. But it was an awkward situation. It's not only high school students. They they just think it's a completely else thing, like some something like closer to the ghost, because because um, Upyur uh, doesn't drink blood. At least we we don't see uh, in the Jade that he drinks. That. But in fact, in vampire folklore, in, in Upyur, let's say, vampire original folklore, vampires, uh, vampires like Upyurs and Upyurs, they didn't always drink blood. They could take life force mostly by blood, but it happened that they took it in other way. For example, in uh, Bulgarian folklore, um, there was um, there was a kind of vampires, male vampires, uh, who was returning from the grave. Uh, to her has uh, to, to to his wife to just suck her life force through sexual intercourse. Well, we have uh, very explicit what was then uh, only showed in Western fiction very uh, symbolically. Here we have very explicitly showed 
because in the West, the, the, the sexual, it was problematic in folklore, not that much. So we have this explicit set, but yes, so, right, yeah, assuming Ukyos didn't, didn't always have to drink the special blood. So, uh, so, so then they couldn't be uh, really vampires. And the second question, uh, you talk a little bit about the origin of Vordulak. Uh, you said that the term had a Russian origin. Uh, actually, the origin of the term is to be found in French tradition uh, about Antoine Auguste Calmet, uh, Brucolac. Uh, this book explains many authors, uh, for example, Jan Pototsky. Uh, there is this, uh, in, in La Guzla, there is a story called Le Vampire. Yes, La Famille du Vurdolac is published only later. Uh, yes. Um, but um, uh, it it was written in French tradition, and this uh, Antoine Auguste Calme is one of the um, of the researchers which I mentioned uh, at the 18th century when actually these uh, notifications about uh, about vampire folklore, about vampire tales, went to West, and they needed to be examined. Uh, also. Uh, Catholic Church need to examine them because, uh, uh, in fact, it was happening also on the Catholic lands. Uh, here we have to tell that it's not only um, it's not the the, the, the first time that um, that the, it's not only the, that Catholic Church uh, got to know about them because uh, uh, when I, when I talk about um, but my colleague, a historian one, who is um, actually um, researching uh, the uh, processes of witches, she told that even in the 15th and 16th century here in Poland, they were also among the process of the witches, they were also processes of vampires. So it was happening and with a knowledge of Catholic priests, but local ones. And they got, they really never were, Maybe they were mentioned somehow in Rome, but they were just ignored by marginals and never became a public issue in the West. Only when these researchers, they brought them, they also had to get a little focus from Catholic Church. And they sent uh, between others, uh, Calmet, he was not the other. Uh, in fact, he was really questioned because of uh, his first report, he, uh, he ended with uh, no conclusion. He didn't conclude if they exist or not. So they sent another one. Um, sorry, I don't recall the name. I will check it if you want. They sent another priest to examine it, and he told that uh, that actually don't exist. And then uh, Calmet changed his report a little, but it's not uh, it's not proven that he uh, he really changed his mind. He just changed his uh, his his, uh, his report. Uh, but as you yourself uh, mentioned here. Uh, this name, mm, it was noted by French, uh, but French researchers, and it appears in French tradition, uh, but it was noted uh, by, um, but it, it was noted as a term used on this lens. I'm, I'm sorry if, you've, uh, if you understood me uh, like that, but I didn't uh, meant to tell that it was Tolstoy who actually invented this name. I just meant that he took it from Russian folklore, uh, as uh, many other authors which you enumerate, and I'm very pleased that you know so much, and I have someone uh, who, who is so knowledgeable to talk to. Uh, but these other authors, they also took it from uh, Slavian folklore. And this uh, this name existed in this, within this Latin folklore a long time already because they had to take it from somewhere. So yes, it had uh, Slavic origin, not necessarily uh, Russian. It cannot be proved. It can be also Balkanian one in in other versions like Brikolak or Vurdulak or Brikolak, Brukolak. Um, because actually these Brukolaks uh, they were mentioned that they were were living in some in some Greek island. And um, so they, they were actually existing, they, those names erased and existed within the Slavic, uh, Slavic nations, and they were just uh, noted 
by French authors and got to know by broader uh, international public thanks to French language. Mm, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, there's one. The, the, the Serbian tale. Um, uh, I, it was noted by uh, Paul Barber, which are already quoted here, because uh, it was, uh, if you mean the Serbian tale in which this, uh, mm, this revenant was coming back to uh, suck life for sexual intercourse, if I understand well, uh, it was not a tale which was written in some, uh, in some book uh, up until I knew. Uh, but it was written by a researcher, by Paul Borber, who went to, to ask and to, to examine uh, this, uh, this local Eastern European folklore. And he, he noted uh, this, uh, these things in, he, in his book. It's not uh, put into narrative tale, uh, which, we, uh, which, would be, which we could uh, read as a story that, that there is a man coming back to his wife and put in a whole story. He just mentioned that such as stories were existing uh, within uh, mainly uh, Serbian people, and he notes it in, notes it in, uh, in his book, um, uh, which I quoted, it's uh, here, uh, Vampires, Burial and Death, uh, you can find it mentioning here. Um, and yes, indeed, it's a very a good point, starting point for a story, maybe someone will make a story out of it. Uh, it would be great a great story for uh, some Hollywood movie. But up till now, it wasn't used. So maybe if someone wants, they can go back to Serbian folklore and and use this uh, this way of seeing a vampire. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for such uh, informative answers. Uh, we're running out of time, so I think we'll we'll stop here. But I'm sure. Uh, we can continue this at some um, other point. Just a quick comment from Chrissy. Um, I will read it out loud for the for the recording. Uh, also about the medicalization, I stumbled upon my research uh, on otherness in vampires that they have used them in pamphlets against HIV virus in the 80s era, talking about sexual liberties and other stuff. Sorry. Yep. Yes, I think as I as I've said before, I think there is um, th there there are so many questions about the medicalization that we should probably organize another uh, meeting, maybe in a couple of months' time. Uh, the vampires are never uh, kind of far from our research, so um, I'm sure we'll 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 work something out. So thank you again, Patricia, and thank you all for coming and staying uh, with us till the very end. And uh, I hope to see all of you and more in two weeks' time for our second monsters revisited lecture. Thank you and have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I hope, uh, I think if you let me and if you want, and I'm very pleased that you want, uh, I will uh, prepare some other presentation about this medicalization and then I will ask, uh, I hope all of your questions here. Yeah, I already saw a question about HIV. Yes, it's true. As a vampire, as a kind of uh, epidemic was used, uh, as a kind of metaphorical epidemic was presented along the times. So, from the syphilis to, to, to tuberculosis to uh, to HIV as well. Maybe soon it will be presented uh, symbolically as a COVID pandemic. We will see. And uh, and yes, it's a time. It's a subject I I will gladly explore with you. So if we if we make another presentation, I hope to tell you more about it about this pandemic uh, symbolization of vampires, which is very up to date now. So <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much. And maybe see you next time in uh, in few months and a little earlier because I will also see another presentations of our group. So goodbye. Bye bye everyone.